Cool. Um, all, uh, are y'all uh, ready to get bored with a very boring, uh, uh, very boring presentation? Um, by the way, feel free to leave comments or uh, questions. Um, I have like four monitors going, so I'm, I'm monitoring uh, everything while giving this presentation because it's kind of boring. So I have plenty of time to, to read everything else that's going on at the same time. Um, I am Vince. Uh, uh, I have the website darkhand.com where I've you know kind of cataloged all the things that I've worked on uh, over the past uh, 20 something years in tech. And lately, uh, my uh, favorite hobby has been getting more and more uh, FreeBSD virtualization stuff going, uh, especially around um, uh, VMware and uh, Parallels Desktop uh, for the ARM pl platforms. <clears throat> uh, but before we get into the boring stuff, um, let's let's get into the exciting exciting stuff first. Uh, I want to invite all of you out to the uh, FreeBSD Discord server. Um, so uh, we have about fourteen hundred, a little over fourteen hundred people in it right now. So. Uh, we chat every day about, you know, this, that, everything else, development, using it, um, just ideas, goofing off, uh, you name it, a little bit of everything, um, like ZFS dis discussion, uh, stuff like that. Um, a lot of my virtualization stuff I share there, um, just the ARM embedded stuff in general, uh, I share a lot of that discussion on there. Uh, and uh, we do live sessions, uh, like, all the time, kind of unscheduled. So basically, like this conference, um, but completely ad hoc, unscheduled. Um, oftentimes nights and weekends, um, somebody will just be like, yeah, I'm going to stream what I'm working on. And I'll show uh, a little bit of some of the stuff I've been working on that was actually done over uh, streaming on it. Um, so go ahead and uh, give us a join. Uh, yes, I already know your number one complaint, which is we do not have a native uh, client for FreeBSD yet for uh, Discord. But it's kind of that, you know, chicken and egg problem uh, where it's do they build a client for the users or do we have the users to tell them to build a client? And so right now we're kind of going in the idea that, you know, if we build a user and community about around uh, FreeBSD Discord that we can help push them to uh, give us a native client since it's just a, an Electron app. <clears throat> uh, but now onto the boring stuff. <clears throat> and this is why uh, uh, ARM virtualization has gotten really boring uh, throughout 2021. Uh, in what was it, August of uh, 2020, uh, VMware released their uh, ESXi ARM fling. Uh, their flings are basically just product. Uh, they're not official products. They're tests, demos, just ideas, concepts that they release out to the public just for people to try it and see if they like it or not. Uh, some of them are like uh, web interface add-ons, uh, drivers, different things like that. But they released one really cool, awesome major one, which is their entire ESXi hypervisor, uh, but for ARM. And going into it on day one, I just assumed a lot of things would be broken uh, because it is just, a, you know, an early stage test that, you know, it, it'll run. Maybe you'll get like a basic VM up and running and you don't have all that much else going for it. Uh, but here we can see from this first screenshot on the left, uh, this is uh, in my home lab, uh, a Dell R720 um, with uh, it's a dual socket, um, a dual eight core system. Uh, with a bunch of RAM, bunch of storage, and a whole bunch of VMs running on it, and a, a bunch of uh, virtual networks all on different VLANs. And then if you look at the right, I don't have as much you know built out on it, but it's a, a 16 core, um, the solid run honeycomb uh, board. Uh, but this just as easily runs on Raspberry Pis. I have probably five, between five and 10 Raspberry Pis that are all running this exact same hypervisor right now. Uh, it'll run on any Raspberry Pi 4, um, the 4 gig or 8 gig model. And uh, recently they got it working also on the Pi 400. So if you want, for some reason, a hypervisor inside of a keyboard, uh, that is now possible. Um, but with this, the uh, process of creating and managing and working with your virtual machines is almost 100% identical uh, between x86 and ARM. And that that's, you know, and... So that's how it is today. That wasn't at launch. There was a lot of uh, issues we had to work through, um, like especially with FreeBSD, uh, um, SMP did not work uh, at launch day. Uh, there was some bugs uh, in both the FreeBSD kernel as well as the hypervisor around the uh, the interrupt controller, uh, the, the, uh, the GSE, the generic interrupt controller that uh, prevented... Um, the uh, secondary cores from basically being woken up properly or, you know, there's 
you can go check the bugs to see the exacts behind it, but that's kind of the, the gist of it. And um, that, uh, you know, we worked with uh, the VMware developers and they helped sponsor patches for FreeBSD and they fixed some stuff in the hypervisor as well. So now today you can go ahead and install it and um, like on the 16 core box, I can just start up a 16 core VM and it'll just work right off the bat. Um, there's, there's no hacking or anything else uh, that has to go into that. Uh, additionally, uh, when the hypervisor first came out, the ISO images, um, I'll get to that in just a sec. I have an actual slide on the ISO images. Uh, going back to the, the management real quick. Um, so storage uh, is important for hypervisors as well. Um, with this, I have already on my x86 infrastructure, a dedicated uh, iSCSI uh, storage uh, that I use. It's a um, configured as a two terabyte uh, volume that I can just dump uh, virtual machines into. And for uh, ARM, like I was saying, I was expecting a lot of things to not work uh, on day one. And surprisingly, uh, software iSCSI worked flawlessly on ARM just as well as it does on x86. And if you notice here, the actual UUID of the volume, the uh, the iSCSI target is exactly the same. So I'm actually sharing my existing uh, x86 uh, iSCSI target with my ARM infrastructure. So I didn't even have to provision any new storage or anything like that. I just plugged into the exact same infrastructure that I was already running. And I instantly had storage to dump my virtual machines on. And then um, having multiple hypervisors, like I said, multiple Raspberry Pis, they're all pointing to the same iSCSI store. So I can actually migrate my VMs uh, between the Raspberry Pis uh, without any downtime. Uh, additionally, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the, the, so this right here is an example of actually browsing the data store. So this is my, my iSCSI data store. And uh, early on, um, like I was saying, we did not have the, um, the ISO image for FreeBSD on ARM. Um, the generic kernel did not include the CD-ROM driver. So kind of a, a little... <laughs> Uh, ironic thing that we ran into is that the CD image did not have the CD driver. So when uh, booting from UFI, which is what ARM uses, uh, you know, it goes through its, its basic boot process, it hands it over to the bootloader, and then the bootloader hand, hands it off to the kernel. Uh, once it, uh, it handed off to the kernel, um, reading from the ISO image, or in that case, the, the virtual CD-ROM drive, uh, shifted from UFI over to the kernel, and the kernel didn't know how to read from the disk. And so I went through this convoluted process where I took, um, there was an installer initially for, <clears throat> uh, on a, uh, a, a raw hard drive image instead. We had one of those for ARM. I converted that to a VMDK and then had that as a secondary hard drive or a virtual hard drive attached to a virtual machine. And that's what this uh, installer image is here, uh, me going through that conversion process. <clears throat> And just showing that, you know, again, it's the same storage architecture. Uh, I was using the same storage infrastructure between my uh, x86 and ARM uh, infrastructure. So I can actually do all of the disk image processing on the faster x86 machine to convert the disk images from uh, raw to VMDK and then load them up on the ARM uh, effortlessly. Luckily today, we don't need to worry about that. 13 includes the uh, uh, all virtually every driver that we need at this point. And I'll get into a little bit more about the drivers. Um, and as you can see here, uh, we also have NFS is working great uh, on it as well. A another surprise that, again, things are just working straight out of the box, very, which is, again, why it's very boring. On the left, you can see there's the uh, AMD64 image. And on the right, there's the ARM64 image. And today, if you want to create a virtual machine, you can just load up the disk one image in um, uh, ESXi ARM Fling, and it'll just run through the normal install process like exactly like you'd expect. And I thought about making this presentation even more boring by show, by actually going through step-by-step step of the installer, but I decided to, to scrap that just to make this a, a little bit easier on you guys so you don't get uh, bored with just looking at a FreeBSD installer for the entire presentation. I decided to change it up and show you guys uh, a little bit more of the infrastructure side. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of infrastructure, though, <clears throat> uh, uh, one thing that VMware has going for is that they have um, vCenter which is basically a centralized management system to manage multiple uh, uh, vSphere or uh, ESXi systems all from a single management console. And it allows you to migrate virtual machines live without taking them offline from one machine to another. And even that, uh, even vCenter, 
perfectly integrated with the uh, ARM version of ESXi. So as you can see in, on the left there, I have my one single vCenter instance, and it's connecting to multiple uh, physical locations that are running uh, ARM uh, infrastructure. And I also have multiple physical locations running x86 infrastructure. And everything just all shows up in a single dashboard with a, a single management interface. And I have all of my performance stats, all of my configurations, and everything all in just one nice central place, regardless of what architecture that I'm running. And so that, that makes it, again, easy and boring. So, so if you already know the tools, there's virtually no difference between go, you know jumping from one to the other and having them in the same environment. Um, obviously, because the architectures are different, though, you're not going to be migrating a virtual machine from an x86 box to an ARM box or vice versa because they're completely different architectures. And even on that note, with the, uh, the ARM um, architecture, there's a lot more nuances in the processors than there are with x86. So even though the solid run and the... Um, the Raspberry Pis, I believe, are both A72s. Um, somebody can quote me on that. I'm probably wrong. It might be a different number, but I believe they're both A72s. And even though they're the same like processor generation within the ARM system, there are new, uh, subtle differences uh, between the two where you cannot migrate between those two platforms, but between two different Raspberry Pis, it works. <clears throat> Which is nice because... Um, if you want to like live migrate a virtual machine and then take a Pi offline um, for whatever reason, like if you want to upgrade the hypervisor, uh, that that's something you can do right now, which is uh, also really cool. <clears throat> uh, here uh, again, we see the actual you know virtual machine up and running. Um, we have just a small screenshot from each of them running a BSD info. Uh, but on the the left again, we have our x86 infrastructure. On the right, we have our ARM infrastructure. Uh, one of the cool things here is that uh, starting in, I think it was October of last year, I started working on porting open VM tools, which is the uh, guest tools for uh, VMware. And that allows the guest and the host to communicate back and forth bidirectionally. And part of that communication is that uh, you can see the, the host name there, the IP address, the version of VMware tools running, and a lot of storage information is passed uh, from the guest to the host. Again, tying into all of that uh, management infrastructure, both on ESXi and through the the vCenter client as well, so we can see the uh, the Z root volume at, at you know just on the the root of the file system, and then all of the other uh, you know the default uh, ZFS data sets that are created through the FreeBSD installer. And um, as of today, <clears throat> I believe OpenVM tools. Um, as of uh, 11.3, it is um, fully compilable on ARM, but I don't think we have the uh, the package and the package repository yet, but it uh, it is updated in ports and it takes like a minute at most to compile and install. It's it's a very small package. So uh, even if it's not in uh, the pre-compiled packages, uh, manually compiling it uh, should work uh, flawlessly at this point on ARM. Um, so that's a really good effort by everybody, both inside of VMware and in the FreeBSD community to get uh, both sides of that uh, together and all, all working nicely. <clears throat> so talking about the virtual hardware, uh, this is where things start to diverge quite a bit. I know that this text is gonna be a little bit small um, just because there, there's a lot to show all at once. On the Again, we have the x86 infrastructure on the left and the ARM infrastructure on the right. And on the right, you'll see like one big giant red box. Uh, that is what's called uh, VMCI or the Virtual Machine Communication Interface. And that's one of two drivers right now that we do not have ARM drivers for yet. So if you're looking for a project to pick up, uh, either one of those would be great. VMCI will probably be easier than the other one. The other one is the actual uh, video card driver. And the reason for that is because I believe the VMCI interface is mostly the same between x86 and ARM. The The only reason it isn't directly compilable is because there is a bit of machine code, um, some uh, assembly uh, in the driver, and so that needs to be converted over. The issue with the SVGA driver, uh, the video card driver, is that they've completely redid the, uh, the virtual hardware interface from scratch. So it's not using um, whatever their... Uh, their IO command structure that they were using before, they've swapped it out for something more modern. 
and uh, they've, I believe they've added fe more modern graphical rendering features as well. <clears throat> uh, but there is a whole host of other hardware as well. Um, so while uh, other hardware does work, you have to uh, manually add it to your uh, loader.com file. Uh, but that, right now we've gotten that down to, I believe, only two items left that don't immediately auto-detect on boot. And that is the uh, UMS, the mouse driver, and the uh, SDA um, or SND HDA, so the sound uh, high-definition audio driver. And <clears throat> right now the, the audio driver doesn't apply to ESXi at all since there is no sound on that interface. Uh, it only applies to if you're using it on the on a desktop, like if you're using uh, VMware Fusion, for example, or um, uh, Parallels, Parallels Desktop. Um, e either one of those uh, would need the the sound driver uh, if you want to have audio with it. <clears throat> um, other drivers, though, um, historically we did not initially have the PV SCSI or the uh, VMX Net, so the Par Paralyzed Virtual SCSI driver or the uh, the Para Virtual Network driver at launch. Um, but those drivers had no machine code in them at all, surprisingly. So it was just a matter of just ticking the box in the kernel to enable them, and now we ship them with generic, so everybody can benefit from them, which is uh, really nice. Uh, so again, at this point, uh, as far as those are concerned, uh, they have now hit the boring category where you just install FreeBSD and it works out of the box just as expected. And uh, we've worked upstream with uh, the VMware devs uh, because despite having the PV SCSI driver working in FreeBSD, it actually didn't work right in the hypervisor initially. Uh, so reading and writing um, worked great, but uh, their uh, uh, virtual UFI BIOS uh, would not boot from it. So if you had it as a secondary drive, like a, just a generic storage drive, it worked great. But as a boot drive or the OS drive, it would just fail to boot. Uh, they've since fixed that, which is really nice. So again, putting it back to the, the boring category. Early on, what I was doing is I was still using the virtual SATA interface for my boot drive. And then I would use uh, PV SCSI for my larger storage drive for a little bit more performance with uh, my MariaDB databases that I run on ARM. Uh, in my home lab for testing. <clears throat> uh, funny enough, while working on that uh, that last uh, running uh, the hardware info and pulling that, that particular website actually has a check for virtual machines. And if it's a virtual machine, the uh, it'll actually remove the the um, the information after a few days because they don't want to keep a lot of VM VM information around. They want to kind of have the website focused on real physical hardware. And it turns out that it wasn't detecting ARM virtual machines at all. And I went and did some digging. And it's actually because uh, in the FreeBSD source code itself, um, it, uh, the ARM code was never built with the idea of virtualization in mind since it's just, since it's so new to the industry right now. And so uh, kern uh, dot VM underscore guest uh, shows as none on ARM, even if you're running inside of a virtual machine. And uh, the uh, identcpu.c file for x86 uh, has a bunch of detection code for a lot of different uh, hypervisor platforms. And all of that code is currently missing on ARM. So if you're looking for a project to pick up, uh, that would be a, uh, a very great, good place to start if you're familiar with uh, kernel programming. Uh, it shouldn't be too terribly complex. Uh, just uh, looking at how it's done on x86 and applying it to ARM because a lot of the uh, detection processes should be nearly virtually identical between the two. And again, like I said, it just didn't exist before because we didn't have these hypervisors up until the past year. So it wasn't in anybody's mindset or it wasn't, nobody had the ability to test it anyway. So it made sense not to have the code until it was actually usable. <clears throat> so what, what are we actually using this for? Uh, me personally, I'm using it a lot for uh, testing out different versions of applications all at once. So I use zero tier quite a bit for um, like SD-WAN networking. And I, I run uh, a lot of regression tests. So I'll, uh, you'll see here different versions of uh, FreeBSD listed and uh, different commit hashes of the upstream project are also being tested. Uh, so when things break, I can go and have uh, like 10 virtual machines ready to go uh, with 10 different versions of the program and, you know, 10 different operating systems uh, all on one physical piece of hardware. And that's been, uh, that's allowed us to uh, fix bugs and push ports, um, get, get bug fixes for ports a lot quicker going out. 
<clears throat> Speaking of, um, you know, running different software on this, uh, I decided to install a full uh, XFE, XFCE desktop just to show that um, even though we don't have the SVGA driver, uh, the S SCFB or the, the console frame buffer uh, is supported and will run a full desktop. And at that point, you're just doing software rendering, but you still get, you know, whatever the performance is of your CPU and it works pretty well. <clears throat> And here I have uh, Firefox running on both of them. Uh, you may notice though that the two Firefox instances don't quite look the same, and I'm not talking just about the web pages. The actual layouts are a little bit different. Uh, on the left, on x86, we're running the current version of Firefox uh, 92, but on the right, there is Firefox uh, 78 ESR. And the reason for that is because um, the upstream Rust port uh, likes to break a lot on ARM because they don't treat ARM as a um, or especially FreeBSD ARM as part of their uh, regression testing suite. And so it relies on people from the FreeBSD community to find, discover, and report the issues when Rust breaks. And when that happens, every single application that, re that um, re relies on Rust uh, stops working. And one of those is Firefox. And there's a few other applications that I use that are also Rust. But Firefox is the most notable because it's one of the main open source browsers. And, you know, without a browser, you don't really have a modern desktop. So uh, another great way to, for anybody who wants to contribute is just to, you know, monitor, you know, flaky ports like that and uh, keep an eye, uh, you know, test them as new versions are coming out and letting them know when regressions happen. Because right now it's, it's a very manual process. And the more people we have testing that, you know, the, the, the more chance we have of it getting fixed quickly. <clears throat> I do believe as of a week ago when I last tested this. Uh, manually compiling Rust and Firefox will work with um, the current version of Rust and Firefox 92. It's just not a pre-built package in the current package repository uh, because on ARM, those are lagging behind a bit. They're not getting uh, recompiled as often. Uh, but that process takes hours, many, many hours, even on my 16 core honeycomb, that still takes several hours to complete. <clears throat> um, also on my honeycomb, um, this right here is a virtual machine, not the honeycomb, but to give an example, uh, I do have a copy of FreeBSD 14 current that I uh, completely self compile at that point. So it is possible just like on an x86 to run a completely uh, self uh, compiled environment um, for the, uh, the kernel world, everything and upgrade it uh, through compilation rather than uh, new binary installs. So I just wanted to show off that like at, at this point, uh, it is a very stable system. It is, um, I've, I've been doing this for about a year running uh, the same uh, copy of um, FreeBSD current and I've taken it from through 13 current into 14 current and it's still running just fine. And um, I actually have a bunch of jails on it that are running 12 and 13 stuff uh, for different um, testing and compiling. So uh, if you wanna do like the full manual style FreeBSD uh, on ARM again, it's the boring life. It is fully supported. Uh, I also do fully expect to get uh, completely yelled at for running this as root because I was just doing a quick test. Um, but yes, I was running these as root. <laughs> um, so my my personal project, the latest thing that I've actually been doing with uh, one of my ARM virtual machines, specifically on uh, my Mac M1 uh, with Parallels, is I've been porting the Linux C7 uh, packages or uh, ports uh, over to ARM. Um, as you can see here, it works. Linux Ulator does work on ARM. Uh, here's a number of uh, Linux binaries, you know, fully working just fine as they as you would expect. Uh, nothing too complex yet, since this is still uh, you know fairly early in, in development. Um, right now, there's a about a hundred right around 100 total uh, C7 ports, and all but five of them currently compile on ARM. Uh, the few remaining ones, I just need to go in and do a little bit of hackery. It has nothing to do with FreeBSD. It has to deal with uh, working around uh, upstream bugs uh, in uh, CentOS itself. Uh, they actually screwed up their other ARM port. I do understand that C7 is very old at this point, and we want to move on to something newer, but this paves at least an initial, you know, pathway to say, hey, Linux Ulator works on ARM and we have a template for it and we can apply this template to uh, other distributions and getting uh, more Linux binaries working on ARM. Uh, <clears throat> if somebody wants to really, really help out in these efforts, um, there are quite a few ports out there today 
that have the only four Arch uh, listed in them, and they may list AMD 64 or i386. And the reason that they, they have that is because they may not have worked with an earlier version of FreeBSD like back in 12. But since FreeBSD 13 hit and is now a tier one architecture, there have been numerous bug fixes. And the only thing that's preventing certain ports from running is the fact that it's still gated out. And so um, just go through and look at the different ports. Like you can look at fresh ports to see if there's uh, a compile for ARM or not. And uh, if there's one for x86, but not one for ARM, just go and try flipping this one, one and only flag and seeing if it compiles and runs. And more often than not, you're going to see that it will work. So this is uh, just, um, it, it's a fairly simple task, but it's a time consuming pass, task to go through as many ports as possible and try to get them updated and uh, validated. Uh, so right here, um, I, I know some people do have some questions about the uh, performance of virtualization. Uh, this chart I, I built several months ago, so it's not on the current version of the hypervisor, and I do know that they fixed some things. Um, but just to give you an idea, the three sections of the graph, we have the Raspberry Pi performance, the Honeycomb performance, and then the uh, MacBook Air uh, on the M1 performance. And sadly, I don't have anything to compare the M1 to right now, uh, mainly because I only have virtualization. We don't have native free BSD, even though I know the BSD and the Linux communities are actively hacking and trying to get uh, other operating systems working on the M1 processors, which is going to be awesome, quite frank. But uh, overall, you can see that there um, you have maybe a 5 to 10% uh, performance loss uh, using a hypervisor, except in the case of four core on the uh, Raspberry Pi. And I haven't quite narrowed down exactly why that is yet, but it could come down to the way that uh, the scheduler uh, handles that system a little bit differently. Or it could also be the, the fact that I was using a different storage system. And I haven't had the chance to go back and, and look why those results at uh, four core Raspberry Pi um, flipped in their performance, uh, why virtualization was faster than bare metal. That uh, shouldn't be the case. Um, so that, that's going to be an interesting point of, uh, research to go back to at some point when I have some more free time. Uh, and lastly, <laughs> looking ahead to the future, uh, VMware just, uh, this past week announced that their, uh, Fusion Tech preview, uh, for the M1 processor, <clears throat> uh, is now in, uh, private testing. And so anybody can just go and, uh, they have, a, on their Twitter account or their, or somewhere, uh, they are their blog. They mentioned that you could just email them or register and sign up. And they're taking a select few amount of people from the community to test uh, the Fusion M1 uh, tech preview uh, just so they can get an idea of how different operating systems will work on it. And this screenshot is from their official blog. And as you can see, like all of these virtual machines are running at the same time on a single uh, M1 system. And you have uh, Debian, Ubuntu 20, Ubuntu 21, Kali Linux, Fedora Linux, uh, VMware uh, Photon, which is what they use for uh, like vCenter. And of course, down in the, the bottom there, we have FreeBSD 13. And so that is something they're actively looking at and making sure that it is uh, continuing to work. And they've been uh, really good at communicating with us um, back and forth um, to make sure that everything does work properly for the, the FreeBSD community. So that's about uh, all I got right now. If there's uh, any questions, um, I don't see any in the chat. Any in the shared? Will Linux you later move to C8 at soon end of life, or would something like uh, Alma Linux or Rocky Linux uh, be better? Isn't Debian and Ubuntu on the, the roadmap? Um, in terms of that, I don't have a good answer for that because it's more or less what everybody in the community as a whole wants to use for uh, which distributions we want to support. I believe a Bastille Linux right or a Bastille uh, BSD right now is working on Ubuntu uh, jails, and I think that's really really promising. So I'm I'm hoping to start playing with that. And whatever is done for x86 will most likely work flawlessly on ARM at this point. Uh, any information about Beehive on ARM? Uh, how does it relate to ESXi? Uh, Beehive is, um, I've heard that there is an experimental version of Beehive for the ARM platform. I have yet to personally test it, and I don't know the status of it. it was, uh, the last thing that I heard was um, at the um, the FreeBSD Dev Summit, which I think was back in June. And I haven't looked into it since then because I've been busy uh, with other projects.
So those are the only two questions that I see in the uh, the chat here. I hope I answered both of those to the best of my knowledge. So yeah, like especially with uh, which distributions, it's up to the community to decide. Like if if there's a distribution that you want, um, start pulling it in and seeing seeing what we need to to get it to run. And like I said, even if you start on x86, we can move it over to ARM effortlessly. Um, most of the work uh, that I've done for the uh, for um, CentOS applies to any distribution. It was more or less just getting the uh, the package repository saying, hey, there's more than one architecture. There's more than just x86 architecture. There's other architectures. And so as that, that work is being done, it applies there. And honestly, a lot of that work, the way that things are being pulled away from x86 into ARM, and you know, putting those gates into place, those same gates also apply to, to Risk Five. So I'm super excited that more and more people are getting into Risk Five as well, because everything that I'm doing here will apply to there as well with uh, very simple um, changes. So I think that's about all I see there, um, and I'm not seeing uh, anything on our Discord either. So yeah, if you also want to join our discord that would be really really awesome so just join our discord <laughs> i'll bring that up one last time thank you everyone